A warm welcome to Pushing Boundaries, a podcast about pioneering research, breakthrough discoveries, and unconventional ideas. I'm your host, Dr. Thomas R. Bruni. My guests today are Jerry Fontaine and Don McCaskill. I will briefly tell you a little bit about both of these good people. Jerry Fontaine, also known as Makwa Ogima, is Ojibwe Anishinaabe from the Ojibwe Anishinaabe community in Sakig, Manitoba. He was chief during the period 1987 to 1998, so that's about 11 to 12 years, I guess, and has been an advisor to the Anishinaabe communities and industry. Jerry currently teaches in the Department of Indigenous Studies at the University of Winnipeg. He recently moved from Traverse Bay, Manitoba to Toronto. Have I got that right, Jerry? Yes, you do. You do, sir. Okay, so we'll you go, thank you. So we'll go over to Don. Don McCaskill, also known as Capita Art, is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Indigenous Studies at Trent University where he taught for 47 years. Well, that's really something, and served as chair for 13 years. He has edited seven books in the fields of Anishinaabe culture, education, community development, and urbanization. Don lives in Toronto. Okay, well, welcome. Welcome to this little podcast. Um, you, you are the authors of the recently published book, and I can read the English translation quite easily. I may have a little bit of trouble with the Ojibwe. Um, the English translation is to own ourselves, embodying Ojibwe Anishinaabe ways. And I guess in Ojibwe, it is it is the buy-in, the Z win. Well, good, uh, good stuff. Okay, right. welcome. So please tell me, let's start by you guys telling me how the two of you got together that led to the writing of this book, a little bit of your background, either one of well, you. Okay, go ahead, Don. I'll follow your lead. <laughs> okay. Why don't you go, because you, you, you talk about it in the, in the beginning of the book. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I've known Don for, uh, for a, little, a little bit of time. You know, he was... Uh, uh, I went to Trent to complete my my PhD, and, and Don, uh, as luck would have it, uh, became my supervisor. And uh, you know, uh, I've known uh, uh, <clears throat> I knew of him for a long time because uh, you know he knew uh, he knew my uh, he and his father knew my uncle, oh. Phil Fontaine, for quite some time uh -huh. from uh -huh. Winnipeg. Actually, uh, one of Phil's first jobs uh, was working with Don. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, with the, uh, I guess, with the corrections system. So, anyways, that's uh, that's how I knew of Don, uh -huh. and uh, or that's how I came to know him. Uh, the book itself, uh, I was approached. Uh, Don and I both spoke at a uh, at a conference, a C A A U T conference in Ottawa. And, uh, you know, we were on different panels. Uh, by chance, uh, you know, I, I sat on a panel that uh, explored indigenization or talked of, ex of indigenization within the academy by, uh, uh, you know, using uh, uh, teaching approaches, uh, uh, having uh, First Nation, Métis, Inuit peoples, uh, uh, Involved or recognized within uh, within various departments uh, across the across the country, so I was asked. Uh, following that uh, that presentation, I was asked by uh, uh, by one of the publishing companies to, to see if I would want want to talk about that further, to write about it. And uh, I always saw myself as a one trick pony with respect to the academy because I come uh, I come to the academy rather late. And uh, my involvement uh, in everything that I've done has been about resistance, you know. So uh, 
But I think uh, what the publishing company wanted, they wanted something more detailed in terms of the academy. So uh, I went to the person I thought knew the most and knew the best, and that was Don McCaskill. So I asked Don if he would want, uh, if he was interested in co-authoring the uh, uh, this book with me. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history, and here we are. And here you are. All right. And Don? I say that uh, Jerry's uh, presentation that he made in the uh, at the conference was uh, quite provocative and was uh, very well ex it, uh, very well received because it went against the kind of grain about indigenizing the academy. And so that, I think, is what uh, sparked the interest of the uh, publishers. They wanted something, a different approach, a uh, more cutting edge approach uh, to the whole issue of reconciliation um, and uh, indigenizing the academy and, and those kinds of things. And so in the at the beginning of the book, we talk about how we wanted to start the book in a ceremonial way, in a traditional Anishinaabe way. And uh, so we did a pipe ceremony uh, with the, uh, the uh, publisher. They came up to Trent University and we did a pipe ceremony. We did an eagle feather teaching and uh, we established a tradition, a relationship with the publisher in a traditional way. And uh, so that, that I think was an important way of getting things started and they really appreciated that. And, uh, and so the relationship since then has been uh, very good in terms of uh, working through the publication of the book. So Jerry, J Jerry, you, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that your strengths has always been talking about resistance. Yeah, uh, what, my what family. Is, what do you yeah. mean? What do you mean by that? What is what? What, what does that entail? Resistance. I uh, I was born and raised uh, Saging First Nation, and mm -hmm. it's an Ojibwe Anishinaabe community uh, in Manitoba. I come from a political family, quite actively involved uh, in reserve uh, politics, uh, provincial issues, provincial and national issues, actually. Uh, my grandmother, uh, my dad, and my dad's mother was the first uh, uh, Anishinaabe Kwe, uh, woman to be elected under the Indian Act to council mm -hmm. up until 1952. Well, women weren't allowed to, uh, uh, to be involved in anything political. So she was the first elected council. So my... Uh, my world has always been about resist, resist, beginning with my, with, with my cook and with my grandmother. But she pushed, uh, uh, you know, she pushed issues that weren't uh, popular, you know, in, uh, uh, recognition of women's rights, uh, recognition of uh, uh, family rights. Uh, she pushed all of these, uh, all of these issues. And she, in 1952, this is, uh, such a long time ago, and that was before I was born. Uh, you know, uh, she was pushing for change. And she also, uh, uh, in terms of residential school, all of her children and some of her grandchildren went to residential school. So at that time, uh, she was pushing uh, uh, against the old guard, so to speak, you know, challenging the church, the Catholic church, and uh, trying to create a safe space for her children. And you know other parents' children within the residential school, so that was uh, resistance at its uh, finest. And my dad uh, uh, was involved in uh, uh, First Nation politics as well. And in fact, uh, you know, was one of the first. Uh, I, I always say, uh, like his time in council was the time uh, when we, or when the community broke the uh, broke free from the shackles of the Indian agent. Because up until that time, uh, the Indian agent uh, controlled everything. So in terms of uh, uh, meetings, the Indian agent would share. And uh, one of the first meetings, uh, uh, my dad went and told the Indian agent, says, uh, you're sitting in my chair. The Indian agent thought he was joking. My dad said, you're sitting in my chair. And the Indian, the Indian agent didn't move and then started laughing. And my dad said again, you're sitting in my chair. And then the Indian agent uh, said, then asked, well, where do you want me to sit? Mm -hmm. My dad, and then my dad pointed to the corner and said, yeah, that's where you sit from now on. 
and uh, in my mind, that uh, broke uh, broke uh, like the the control that the Indian agent had. And up until a lot of time too, uh, uh, you know, education has been pretty important for our people, for for my family specifically. And uh, it was wasn't popular to have uh, to talk of school committees. Uh, to talk of uh, taking control of uh, education. So this young council of, of men, and this was in the early 60s, and I wasn't, uh, like I was just uh, just a baby. Uh, but they pushed to take control. And then I, I, I remember later, later, you know, as we, uh, uh, I caught the tail end of residential school, and uh, I remember one nun telling me one time, like, uh, what uh, what makes your dad think that he understands education? What makes you think that the other members, the other men know? Because they're, they're nothing but drunks. They're nothing but, uh, well, you live on welfare. And it's, it's uh, you should be thankful that we're here to give you education. So uh, that was the beginning of the, like the, it's been sequential in terms of the movement uh, or the focus on residential school and education. So Phil Fontaine gets elected chief, takes control of the education system, full control, uh, fires all of the uh, Indian Affairs hired teachers, and then uh, uses uh, uses our own people to te start teaching and creates an education program for teachers or works a uh, relationship with, and this was unheard of at the time, you know, uh, established a relationship with uh, Brandon University to train men and women, you know, become teachers, get teaching certificates, uh, education degrees. So that was the beginning, actually. And uh, so... That again is 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 resistance, and then of course, uh, you know Phil continued, you know uh, his trajectory by talking about residential school and uh, the issues of uh, abuse that took place in, in in residential school and the challenges that a lot of our people faced. So that's what I mean, uh, you know, when I stand on the shoulders of resistance, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I was born into the a resistant movement, so to speak, within my own family. Well, I, I find it interesting. I find it interesting that you equate the word resistance with advocating for active change. I, I'm wondering, I mean, to me, the word resistance is kind of passive, whereas advocating for change is so much more active. I, I, I wonder why you have chosen such a passive word for what you are trying to do for me a resistance is really uh it's it's about being active it's about in your face uh you know challenging uh the government uh, uh the powers that be you know it's in your face it's aggressive uh you know we've uh, we've been involved in uh, uh armed resistance you know, there's, uh, I, I see advocacy, I see it the other way. I see advocacy as more of a, uh, eh, mm. more of a friendly way of uh, posing your risk. But resistance, in my mind, is is really active and very aggressive. Okay, so we have established that. Now, that's the, another word that most of you are using is indigenization. Indigenization within the academy. Well, what do you mean by that? Do you want to have that, Don? Don, why don't you try that? Sure, yeah. And the uh, probably back in the, in about ten years ago, particularly with the publication of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, there is a, a, a mushrooming of awareness of indigenous issues, particularly, of course, of the abuses that took place in the residential schools, but generally the situation with regard to indigenous people generally, and um, the universities, among many, many other institutions, recognized that there needed to be 
um, then become much more uh, welcoming, much more friendly, much more reflective of indigenous people. And so they, uh, and universities kind of led the way in this process they called indigenizing the academy. And so what you have is things like the uh, land acknowledgement now that is said before um, every meeting that uh, is, is held, they uh, put uh, indigenous art on the walls, um, there had already been a lot of indigenous studies departments out there um, that uh, you, you could argue have been indigenizing the academy for many years, but they did try and expand some of the indigenous programs to other faculties. Um, they Sometimes they hired a, uh, an administrator, maybe even at the vice president level, that was an indigenous person with a mandate to indigenize the academy. Um, and. So the, so the universities have recognized there needs to be a, a, a movement towards um, being more uh, um, reflective of indigenous culture, indigenous polit politics, indigenous uh, academics. Um, but we're, what we argue in the book is that that really doesn't go far enough. And in many cases, it's, it's fairly token because it doesn't involve a shift of any kind of power, any kind of authority in terms of decision making. And it doesn't uh, uh, really reflect the university um, uh, involving indigenous people in any kind of significant way or changing the, the nature of the institution in terms of how decisions are made, in terms of uh, many of the kinds of things that you, you see as indigenous people are working with, um, and Anishinaabe people are working for, with regard to self-government, um, decision-making authority, that kind of thing. So. We're fairly critical of the concept in the um, in the book, but certainly uh, universities would see themselves as really being on the, the vanguard of trying to uh, reflect indigenous culture and in in their in their institutions. Um, you you mentioned land acknowledgement. Uh, I live in Stratford, where we have lots of theater, as you know, and before every performance, every lecture. Uh, there is this expression of gratitude to the First Nations for taking such good care of this land. And do you, th apart from the fact that people are getting really tired of it, um, <laughs> really, really tired of it, um, do you see any good coming out of that? Well, I think it's 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 the first step, but it's it's not particularly uh, significant because it's so easy to say, and it doesn't really get into some of the key issues like this. It doesn't get into acknowledging the treaty and the treaty rights that Indigenous people have, which implies that some kind of action needs to be taken. It's more of a feeling good about the fact that uh, now we can uh, raise the awareness and acknowledge Indigenous people in some ways in their in their in their being on the land, but it it it's fairly token as far as I'm concerned. Jerry, you may want to say what you yeah. think. Uh, I agree with Don. It's uh, a lot of this is performative. I make the point in the book that it's strange with all these land acknowledgments and so on. The only place I can exercise my my treaty right as a treaty First Nation person or as a treaty Ojibwe Anishinaabe is on, either on my own reserve or other reserves throughout Canada. That's the only place I can, uh, that my treaty rights are respected. Uh, the land acknowledgement do absolutely nothing for me. Uh, they, they mean nothing. And more often than not, they're, uh, they're spoken in English. And the land that they're supposed to be acknowledging has, has a certain memory of a language that was first spoken. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do a land acknowledgement, you should... Uh, uh, you should uh, speak in the language that the land remembers because the land and the language are one of the same. And uh, so for me, uh, like uh, I'm probably like uh, a lot of the people that are just plain tired. We, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, it's performative. And I'll, I'll just use this example of, uh, so there's these, two young Ojibwe Anishinaabe sisters, they were at the University of Winnipeg. So they asked the older, uh, she was in a higher, uh, she was a senior, so they asked her to, to do the land acknowledgement. So she did it in English, even though she's a fluent Ojibwe, Ojibwe speaker. 
So she did it in English. And then the guy, the, the guest, next guy that followed was, uh, he was a white guy. He was the dean. And he spoke in Ojibwe one. And then when this young girl went to sit with her sister, she, was, she said, Jesus Christ, they're even out indigenizing us now. You know, uh, she <laughs> right. made that. Uh, yeah. Uh, she made. She just found it hilarious that yes, uh, yes, yes. even though he bastardized the uh, the language, he made that uh, that attempt. So well, to at, her, least, like, at least he thing. tried, right? That's at, right. At least, at least he tried. So in in your book, um, you suggest um, that the Ojibwe ways of doing and knowing, as well as Ojibwe Anishinaabe values, language, and ceremonial practices can provide an alternative to Western political and academic institutions. Could you could you just uh, unpack that for me? So for me, Ojibwe uh, uh, for me, that's foundational for me in anything that I do, because it's our way, uh, it's our way of, of doing or uh, uh, to come to know things. And uh, and it's really uh, in the book. Uh, in the book, uh, it says that it's subjective and it's pers- so personal to a fault. You can't you can't take yourself outside of this uh, uh, outside of this idea or or outside outside of this. Uh, uh, I don't know if I, if uh, the approach the the academy on the other end is. I find it's sterile, you know. Uh, uh, you're told uh, to be objective. You're told to be neutral. And one of the first problems I had uh, in writing anything about uh, myself or or uh, my nation was that uh, I, uh, you, uh, I I didn't know how to write uh, uh, outside of the outside of the circle, so to speak, because for me I'm so immersed in everything that we do in all of the in the language in of the ceremony i just can't uh, I, I couldn't uh, i couldn't write outside of that i i couldn't see myself uh, as separate from a- anything or and everything that we do to come to this place of knowing okay so can you be more specific like how does your outlook differ from Canadian Western values and, and, and doing things. How what what are some specific differences? Well specific well, there's 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 plenty I guess. Uh give me uh, a I, okay first and foremost I don't see myself as Canadian. I don't see myself as part of the academy uh, because I think I'm an outlier in many instances. And uh uh, on the other side of uh, on the other side of the line or the boundary, uh, or in the other canoe, I'm uh, I'm more immersed in my language. You know, I know uh, I know, for example, that uh, when I speak with Jibwemun, for example, and uh, the it's my mom I hear. It's my mom's voice I uh, I hear. Uh, I know when I speak with Jibwemun, the land on which I stand remembers, uh, remembers me. This is one of the reasons when I, before I begin anything, I say, well, this is who I am. So the land remembers my name and also remembers my clan. So there's an immediate connection between the land and myself. So I, I can't detach myself from that. Also in terms of uh, uh, when we talk ceremony, the ceremony takes us, uh, connects us to a different, uh, a different place. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's spiritual, obviously. Uh, ceremonies are also with they, uh, and Don can maybe speak to this as well. You know, it takes you to a different spirit, uh, a different realm, because the 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 voices that you hear, uh, it sound like a crazy man when I say that, but the voices that come to you. The teachings that come to you from uh, from a de- another dimension, uh, you can say, "Well, hi, how does that happen?" No, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's not my question. Go on. Yeah. So, uh, so ceremonies uh, uh, are are really uh, for me uh, pretty foundational in anything that I do. And uh, the other thing, uh, 
in terms of uh, 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 language, ceremony, and worldview in Andaman, everything that I, everything that I am, and how I view the world comes from a, a very specific place in the universe, and that, that's Sagatong, where the river widens. My family rests there, and uh, perhaps that maybe that's where I'll rest too when uh, uh, when I leave this uh, this physical world. So it's really uh, uh, for me, uh, my worldview is uh, like is is really uh, specific to a specific place, specific teaching, specific ceremonies, language, and so on. And so I have uh, I can't make that. I, I can't make that connection between you asked about the the Canadian uh, perspective. I can't because I don't see myself as Canadian. Yeah, I speak English. I live in this place. Uh, they call Canada, but I don't really recognize it. And I don't think Canada as a whole, like Canada as a as a physical place doesn't recognize me either. If you, you if you if you take um, in terms of the different worldview, if you if you take language for an example. And putting a uh, kind of an, a Western analysis on this, English is very much a noun-based language. And when you establish uh, the ground the language in a noun, you create uh, concepts. And there's a, a gap between you and the concept because, as Jerry says, you objectify your, your understanding of the world. And so because you're talking about it in terms of a thing, a noun. And that has implications in terms of your, your worldview, in terms of how you understand the world, how you perceive it within the particular cultural context, because language is so fundamental in expressing, expressing the culture. Absolutely. So that if, you, if, you, if you see, for example, the land as, as a thing, you can see it, the next step could easily become seeing the land as a commodity. And mm -hmm. if you see the land as a commodity, then you can exploit it for economic purposes purposes and is based to some degree on the Judeo-Christian concept of right. <laughs> you know, man has dominion over the earth. Right. Where Ojibwe, Ojibwe win, uh, and Ashnawe win, uh, indigenous languages tend to be much more verb-based. And verb-based implies a, a closer relationship, especially when you're talking about the land, and it Im implies action. It implies having to do something. And so that when you talk about the land and ceremonies and everything is interconnected, and so you need to take care of the land because they see it as, as their mother, literally their mother mm. that provides for them. But the land takes care of you and you have to take care of the land in the reciprocal relationship. And um, so it's a very different way of approaching understanding the land through the vehicle, vehicle of, of a language and then, of course, the ceremonies emerge from from the language as well, and uh, and and uh, so and and they, there's it starts with the fundamental belief, as Jerry says, that all things are spiritual, that uh, the trees, the land, the the, um, the water, they all have spirits. So that when you when we went fasting out in uh, out in Alberta for many years in the 80s, we would always take the tobacco or sema and put it. In the uh, we were when we were cutting, for example, um, willows for the making the sweat lodge or the fasting lodge, we would always present tobacco and ask the spirit of the willow <laughs> to allow us to take part of their their uh, their their, their uh, tree and, and and use it in a good way as part of a ceremony. And so again, all of these things are connected, and uh, the ceremonies were conducted in the language and. Uh, and the, it reinforced the worldview that everything is alive and has a spirit and you need to take care of it. So, and it's all expressed within the language. And in the book, we try to use the language and explain these different ideas to uh, a non-Indigenous audience as well as an Indigenous audience. And as Jerry says, it's difficult to explain these things in, in, in English, in a book, um, but that's what we're, we're trying to do because we want the book to be appealed to a non-Indian non-indigenous audience as well as an yeah. right. right okay that's very helpful very good so my next question follows this so is that the reason that first nations in north america sort of avoided sort of any 
exploration of science, like the way the Greeks did, the Egyptians did, the Babylonians did, uh, South America, the Incas, uh, they all got into pretty complicated scientific explorations, particularly in terms of mathematics, but also in terms of physics, chemistry. Uh, very little of that has happened here. Uh, what is the reason for that? Uh, I would disagree. Actually, there was yeah. a lot of uh, there was a lot of exploration of science because we understood the uh, we under we understood the world. We knew, for example, that the world wasn't flat because uh, we knew that uh, uh, the sun rises in the east, sets mm -hmm. in the west. Yes, every day. Yes, we know that uh, that the seasons uh, uh, change as well. You know, you have winter. You have spring, you have summer, you have fall. We also knew, for example, that uh, you talk about math and mathematics. We also understood the uh, people were of the belief that we uh, that we didn't have math, but we have numbers. We have very sophisticated and complicated numbers that understands the relation between mathematics and and the world. And we also knew, for example, that uh, well, I mean, you have. Uh, 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 I look. Uh, uh, I look. Uh, I look to Einstein as an example. You know, Einstein came to this. Uh, so we have the understanding of the world, one millisecond before the Big Bang, and we know, for example, that one millisecond before the Big Bang, there was a sound. Yeah. What sound? The sound of a the sound of a shaker, like uh -huh. if you, uh, and I don't know, I don't, I don't have a shaker. I'm sure Don doesn't. I want if you shake something, yes, it's like. <laughs> so we knew what the world was before the Big Bang. We we have explanations of what was taking place at that time, one millisecond before the Big Bang. And when we, uh, uh, when I've heard elders talk about this man called Einstein, he, they say, well, he came to this door. He didn't go beyond that door because he was, uh, he didn't understand what was behind that door. And the elders will say, well, what was behind that door was spirit. So in many ways, uh, we make, uh, we say, well, uh, we make that connection between science and spirit that there's, uh, they're one of the same. Uh, you look at, uh, uh, for example, uh, the book talks about uh, uh, shape shifting. How is that? How is that mm -hmm. physically possible? How is that scientifically possible? Mm -hmm. But there are there are explanations to that. Uh, also, uh, the idea of time travel. You have uh, the book references or makes uh, mention of uh, Shingwok, who was able to travel uh, from the eighteen hundreds. To, to the point of first contact. And people try to reason this. Well, there, mu there must have been two Shingwaks. So how could Shingwak uh, live in the 18th century and then go back to the point of first contact with, uh, with the first people that set foot on Manitouke? And Shingwak describes, uh, he writes about, uh, about the, the ability to travel in time. To go from this place to this one place, and he records his uh, he records his stories at uh, uh, Agawa Canyon. It's, uh, it's, I say Ag Agawa Canyon's uh, just west of uh, Bawitigo or Sault Ste. Marie. So he writes of those things. The uh, uh, the scrolls as well also describes uh, DNA. You know, Don and I have talked about that. I've showed him. Uh, uh, the scrolls uh, are scrolls that that speak of this uh, DNA. So uh, yeah, we understood the uh, we understood science, but we just didn't call it that. We called it uh, uh Again, it's it's a uh, it's a way of kikenda uh, aswen. You know, it's it's this it's this knowing. Uh, and I I in I. In a lot of my language, I, for example, I never use the word knowledge. Don made the point that, you know, we're verb-based. So for me, everything is about knowing things. 
uh, and knowledge has no place in in my language. So, anyways, but that's uh, you know that's our understanding of uh, of science. And the, you mentioned the Greek, for example, Aristotle and Plato uh, and uh, stories. We had uh, you know we we made use of stories as well at Sukanak, Awajigemanan, Dipachimanan. You know we. Uh, um, yeah, so we really, uh, I think, in terms of what the the uh, uh, ancient uh, uh, peoples that you're mentioning, you know, we I think we had something very similar. And uh, uh, I would ask you, you know, if you know, if you look at a scroll, for example, like to explain that it's pretty detailed, it's pretty complicated. And it speaks to all things, uh, all things that exist in science. Yeah, I think there's it's a misnomer to think that indigenous people didn't have a sophisticated science. I mean, obviously, the most obvious example are the Mayans, who had an incredible understanding of, right. of the of the uh, the heavens, the stars, right. the right. solstices, right. and all yeah. of that. Yeah. But in addition, I mean, even the Anishinaabe people, for example, if you're going to make maple syrup, if you're going to understand the medicinal properties of the plants, if you're going to understand the dimensions and how to measure uh, to make a canoe and the materials that have to go into it, there was a, a sophisticated system of mathematics. As a matter of fact, we, we uh, in a project that is, was the national project called NCCIE, National uh, um, uh, National Collaboration in uh, Indigenous Peoples and uh, in Indigenous Education, we developed a series of um, curriculum that is based on uh, Indigenous understandings of all of the different disciplines. Obviously, environmentalism and uh, is, is something that is, is clearly uh, related. You can see the connection with Indigenous people and environmentalists, of course, are recognizing more and more the fact that, there, that the worldview of the indigenous people had a lot to say in terms of taking care of Mother Earth, much more effective than the way we have done it. But we, we also developed a mathematical curriculum that, uh, that talked about measurement, that talked about concepts of, uh, of using materials in particular ways and constructing them and all that. So, so I think there's more and more people are beginning to recognize that there was a sophisticated understanding including a scientific understanding uh, of the world. I mean, so many of the medicines, for example, that we use now, if you look at pharmacopoeia, you know, about 70% of all of the medicines that, are, that now we use, including aspirin and all those things, were based on indigenous uh, medicinal plants in the past. I remember going to, uh, with an elder through the woods in uh, Northern Ontario, and I was thinking, well, if I ever got lost here, I would be in big trouble or if I got injured. And he said, well, it'd be crazy because, you know, 70% of the plants all around you, you can either eat or, you know, use for medicine. And I had no idea. Most uh, urban, urban people don't have that. So, so there is actually, um, there's more and more being recognized and sophisticated understanding of uh, yeah. I, science. I would just add as well, uh, you know, Don, uh, uh, remind me in terms of, uh, like we have, uh, we have words for every part of our body. So we know, for example, if you had a if you have a kidney ailment, you know what medicines to use. If you have a liver issue, you, we know uh, what medicine to use for that. And if you're uh, like if you're bleeding to suppress uh, the bleeding, you know we know uh, uh, you know what medicines or what plants or what herbs will uh, uh, will help with that. And the uh, I come makone to ten. On Bear Clan, people will tell you that uh, if you follow a makwa in the wild, a bear in the forest, any plant, herb, or a root, uh, tree, bark that the bear eats are all medicinal. And they each have a, uh, each of the roots, bark, and so on, leaves, you know, are. Uh, uh, yeah, are helpful from a medical perspective. I tell a story in the, in the book about uh, an elder and I in 
when we were out in the fasting camp in Alberta, he wanted to go and to get some medicine. And so he asked me to come with him. And I brought a, a big bag thinking it was going to be a lot of herbs and plants and things like that. And we, we went, we drove to maybe 20, 30 miles in the mountains, a very isolated place. And he started walking up the mountain and this way and that way and this way, looking for this particular medicine. And he turned to me and he said, they're trying to fool me. And I said, what? There's nobody <laughs> within 25 miles of here. Who's trying to fool you? Well, it was the spirits that were trying to fool him because he was connected to it. And eventually, after quite a long time, he pointed up onto a cliff. And there was a cave there. And he said, that's where the medicine is. And he went up there and he scraped some of this medicine from this kind of a tar-like substance that came out of the rock and put it, you know, this much, and he, half for me and half for him. And it was bear medicine, one of the most important uh, medicines of all. And that, that uh, cave was where the bear hibernated, who knows how long ago. And that medicine I used when I had uh, prostate cancer to help with the, con with the prostate cancer, along with Western medicine as well. And uh, so, you know, that, that's the kind of understanding of the Mother Earth that the uh, Anishinaabe people have. And the, the connection between science and spirit is so important, but that because we've secularized our understanding of science, we, we don't make that connection. Although Einstein in a way it, it did make those connections with his he abstract did. and he did. Of, uh, yes. relativity and all those things. Right. How, uh, what is the percentage in Canada of indigenous people? What percentage of the population? Well, in, in what, the prairies, uh, I don't know. In uh, the prairies, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, yeah. it's around ten percent. About ten percent. And then in other places, because of the larger population, Ontario, Ontario actually has the largest number of Indigenous people, but percentage-wise, it's less. Uh, but if you go to Thunder Bay or Sudbury, of course, it's it's uh, higher. But even within the city of Toronto, there's probably they estimate between sixty and eighty thousand Indigenous people. So, if you could do anything to improve the lives of indigenous people, what would it be? For me, uh, the first thing would be to uh, respect and honor the treaties of Goi Tu Uh The treaties, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, we don't have a word, you know, Ojibwe for treaty. You know, it's a European construct. It's, uh, it's uh, a word or uh, concept that Europeans brought to these to these talks with our people. So our understanding of uh, of, of the treaty relationship is very different. You know, we uh, we say, for example, that the first relationship, the first relationship of sharing, was between Kitche Manitou and Anishinaabe, the Creator and uh, and uh, human being, and the Creator gave life. To the human being, the human being agreed uh, that he will live according to the teachings. So that's the first relationship. And then the second relationship of sharing that was established was between Voiseyag, the, the animals, and Anishinaabe, you know, uh, the human being again. The Voiseyag agreed in council that they would give their lives to make sure that a uh, human being would uh, would would live would have some sustenance and uh human being again in terms of a reciprocal relationship uh agreed that uh you know we would honor Oesiag, the animals and we would feast them annually and makwano to tame my bear clan so i honor the you know i honor the bear for uh uh, for what he's done for me, so, and then the the third sharing relationship was between the European and the Anishinaabe, where we agreed uh, to share all of the bounty of Manitou Oke, and uh, so that's land, that's a uh, uh, sustenance, that's whatever the uh, whatever uh, Manitou Oke or Mother Earth uh, agrees to. Uh, uh agreed to provide to human beings generally speaking and uh unfortunately you know there hasn't been really been uh you know we've disrespected the uh, manitou 
the spirit of the land, you know, at every, uh, at every step. So for me, that's the first thing. And the second thing is to, uh, uh, is to understand the, the value of separation. Yeah, Canada sees itself as this uh, great, uh, uh, as this great country. You know, our people on the other end don't uh, don't see it in that way. And for our survival, uh, we need some some separation. And and the book uh, uh, the book speaks to that. So uh, those things in my mind are the two most important things. So what what sort of separation do you have in mind? Well, uh, you know, when we first uh, first point of contact, you know, we uh, uh, there's a two row wampum, you know, that uh, uh, that told the story of these two nations, uh, uh, these two peoples that uh, traveled down the same river, uh, side by side, separate from one another, each one respecting the values and. Uh, uh the world view and and uh, uh the the organization of society of their society so these two boats go down the same stream and uh, never uh do we never does one human being and the other canoe uh, uh, interfere with the other so there's that there's that respect of separation and uh, uh, the book also talks about now, okay, the middle ground. And the middle ground is where, uh, uh, you know, when I talk of separation, the middle ground is where these, uh, these two nations come together uh, to talk about issues regarding, uh, well, whatever the issues might be. You know, you look at, a, you look across the country, our people are the poorest of the poor. You know, there's, uh, there's issues with homelessness, there's issues with housing. Actually, uh, you know, when I uh, uh, walk uh, to City Hall in Toronto, I see homeless people. So it's just not a, it's just not a First Nation issue now. So okay. we have, a, uh, you know, we uh, we have a common issue here. So how do we resolve that? Uh, yeah, that's how I see separation. Uh, uh, I use housing as an example that you know there's commonalities uh, uh, that we we can address in in. In this place, I see as the middle ground, and that might be uh, that could be parliament, that could be someplace else, uh, the legislative assembly, but the the two peoples have to come together at some point to talk about these issues, so that uh, this idea of separation can uh, uh, can be uh, respected and uh, fulfilled. So, would you like to have your own state within Canada? Yes. Of, oh, yeah. Yeah, your very yeah. own country. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, I come from Sagatong, Dunji. I'm from this place uh, called where the river winds, which is part of the Ojibwe Anishinaabe Nation, uh, and the Ojibwe Anishinaabe Nation, which is part of the three fires, Nishwishkate Kan and Nishinaabe Kodushkate Kan, the three fires Confederacy, which is made up of the Ojibwe, the Udawa, and the Potawatomi. So that's. Uh, for me, uh, that's my community. Mm -hmm. For me, uh, uh, that's my nation. And Don, do you do you agree with do you agree with that? <clears throat> yes, uh, for sure. Um, right now, there's a, a major uh, initiative, you know, which is termed uh, reconciliation between the uh, non-Anishinaabe people and the Anishinaabe people, and uh, the, the whole purpose of the book, to some degree, is to try to educate the non-Indigenous people as to how a true reconciliation might happen. And that is the, to, first of all, come to an understanding and an honoring of Indigenous culture. And we talk about three processes, one of which is a kind of environmental ethic that you have to, first of all, understand. And we talk about it as one dish and one spoon. There's only one uh, dish and that is the land and there's only one spoon that's human beings and we are all eating from the same place and we're sharing a a meal together which is a very much an indigenous uh, concept and idea of any kind of relationship being established and it's not just of course it's the same in many cultures we share a meal together first of all to establish relationship and then secondly we we talk about um, 
coming into each other's camps. Um, traditionally, even traditional enemies, like for example, um, two different uh, indigenous groups would come together in the uh, winter time to the other person's camp and live there together and share meals and share ceremonies, even though they would then go back in the summer and maybe uh, you know, conflict again. And then the third was the one that Jerry talked about, the middle ground where the indigenous people and the non-indigenous people came together. But the key is that the non-indigenous people needed to come sort of halfway and have a, an understanding <laughs> of, as Jerry says, what's in the other canoe um, and honor that and to agree to that. Um, so we argued that if those three different um, phenomenon are together, we can have some kind of uh, True, uh, true reconciliation and oh. uh, an understanding of, of, of both sides in some kind of degree of equality. Because right now, indi indigenous people are almost always on the on the turf of the non-indigenous people. They're speaking English. They're in parliament with inst Western institutions or universities or whatever. And now there needs to be a kind of a, a moving to more towards the uh, the center, as as Jerry says and and honoring the treaties and, and and a lot of that is happening i mean there is a the mm -hmm. courts have uh, insisted for example recently that the uh, robinson treaty that was signed signed uh, 150 years ago be honored and it wasn't honored and so now there's been a substantial um financial compensation to the first nations communities that um that have uh, were not honored the treaty where the treaties wasn't honored and the federal government and the provincial government have provided financial resources now in in that and of course there's you know there there is to some degree some level of independence and self-government in all of the mm -hmm. uh, first nations communities where they control a lot of the municipal services they control the education system they control mm -hmm. so in that sense the concept of nationhood is somewhat different, um, but it's it's there, and and more and more the Canadian government and institutions are recognizing are recognizing that. But there's still a long way to go to be able to come. Thank to the you, point. thank you. That's uh, that's a positive note on which we shall conclude our discussion. My guests today have been Jerry Fontaine and Don McCaskill. Their book, To Own Ourselves: Embodying Ojibwe Anishinaabe Ways. Uh, has been published, and uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, you will find a lot of information, as we have found it right here, that you're not familiar with, and that may be, you know, very new and very influential in terms of um, which way we live our lives in the future. So I just want to say, Jerry, Don, thank you very much, and until we meet again, take care. Bye-bye. Miigwech. Thank you.